this is the connecting community initiative committee cci see apparently meetings normally held at the municipal office are being held remotely with adequate alternative means of public access and where required public participation provided in accordance with governor baker's june 16 2021 act extending certain COVID 19 measures adopted during the state of emergency including an extension of the remote participation provisions of his march 20 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law general laws chapter 30a section 20 remote meeting connection information was included in the agenda posted on the town hall website. Excellent. Thank you. Wendell. I'll make a motion to open the Deerfield Select Board. Second. Thank you. All right. Sounds good. All right. I was just going to do a um, little we'll call to order uh, meeting guidelines. Please speak one at a time. Follow Deerfield Code of Conduct. Be respectful, considerate, courteous, concise, and non repetitive. And I'm really serious, when you want to talk, please raise your hand, whether it's a little yellow hand or a hand like this. So we don't all talk at once, I'd appreciate that. I'm gonna do a roll call, uh, Julie. Chalfant, Julie's here. There you go. That's okay, that's okay, go ahead. Lily is here. here. Tim? Here. Tim. Yep. Kate Lawless? Here. Oh, thank you, Kate. Uh, let's see, Andrea is, she's going to be in an open space meeting. I'm here. Trevor, here. Uh, Darius never comes. Here. Carolyn. Yes, you're here. here. Uh, John Pachark, he should be on momentarily. Jennifer Remillard, she's typically a little later. Dave is not here. M.A., you're here. And Annalise. I am here. Here. Okay. Annalise here. Here. And set who has a library meeting, she may not be able to make. Great. Okay, thanks. So now that everyone is here, I'd just like to welcome Lauren and Ben. We appreciate you coming and um, take it away. Okay. Um, so I, I, I guess I, I would like to ask you guys first what you're hoping to get out of this particular interaction. So background for those who are not Denise M.A. or Carolyn, Denise M.A. and Carolyn asked the UMass Clean Energy Corps to take a look at um, a set of buildings around that kind of central core in South, South Deerfield. Um, and we kind of separately discussed the elementary school and that's not that didn't end up being part of what we ended up focusing on. And we end up focusing on these two currently non-usable buildings, uh, the church and the old uh, grammar school, which was a, the senior center. So that's context. I have, you know, called up the slides that we used to present to the, uh, in May, but those may not, you may not want as much detail as those provide or as much technical uh, background. So I kind of would like to get a sense of what sort of decision point are you at? What, what, what information is most useful to you? And I just want to add that if you haven't heard, we have a recording of the detailed yeah. presentation that was given about a month ago. So if, if we don't do that all tonight, anybody who hasn't seen it can, can watch that recording. Lauren, I did send that out to everyone okay. and I did ask people to watch it and have to have, have some questions ready. Great. So hopefully somehow. Um, okay, Lily. So I, I did watch and I have some questions, but um, maybe the thing would be if, if we could have um, give like a high level summary because you're mm -hmm. right, it was a very detailed mm -hmm. uh, presentation and then maybe we ask our questions after that, that work? Yeah, I, I think that does. Um, let's see, it, it, would it be possible for me to share my screen? Looks like it is. Yes, it um, is. So I'm gonna use these as, as helpful tools, but I'm not gonna actually present through every single one of these uh, slides. Um, this just shows what, what we're focusing on. Um, you know, these are the buildings you know, um, and some of it, it, the important message we wanted to get across right away was that these buildings are not going to be 
easy or inexpensive to just keep around so you are at some sort of a decision point. Um, and we think that's kind of like, do we actually set, sound the death knell for these buildings or do we make a pretty major investment into repurposing them so that they actually serve a function for the city? May I see you, you have your hand up. Oh, uh, no, my hand up, my hand was up because I, you asked about things that we wanted to focus on. Oh yeah, let's hear that then. And so I, I just, I think the most important thing for us to begin with is the bricks on the senior center. All right. That, that but not now, I mean, go ahead doing what you're doing. And then All right. that was, I was just, that was my comment and I'll put my hand down. So, so our, and, and, but that is, that is one, I'm sure one of the more controversial issues is just the, the aesthetics and cost of the solution we've proposed. And again, so looking at these buildings, we don't see kind of an inexpensive half measures approach that allows you to meet the goals of historic preservation. So having the buildings have durability, to have them have a function that's healthful and, and good for the town and to pursue your zero carbon goals. So if you wanna do all of those things, half measures are not gonna work with these buildings. That, that's our first takeaway. Um, so the first takeaway is the way we see it, and, and we understand this has already been under discussion, is that re, essentially repurposing the former grammar school, former senior center as town offices, and then something that I think has been less clear is that the church basically can function as a senior center and can serve the auditorium functions. For both buildings, a drainage system is going to be critical uh, because both of them are highly vulnerable to water and that's gonna only become more so. Um, so we can go back to this image if, if for clarity, but this basically is a kind of a, a graphic representation of the different components of the system. Uh, so the, the grand vision is that they're gonna have a shared heating and cooling system using an exchange field so to exchange heat with the earth basically as a storage system. And that both buildings are actually going, would be quite high performing uh, buildings in terms of their envelopes and their HVAC systems. And we'll get into details on that if you guys require it. <laughs> um, okay, so this gets right to the problem. So when we went and visited the building, um, so what I'll say is that we live in New England. We have a lot of these old brick buildings. And 90% of the time, I will say that there is a solution that allows you to use the existing brick structural masonry building. So this is where the, the outside wall is also the thing that holds the building up, right? That we can use that material and it's got enough quality and there's a, enough protection from moisture uh, that we can actually insulate from the inside and make it a relatively energy efficient building. This is not one of those buildings, um, or at least I'm not willing to put my, uh, stake my reputation on having said that it's one of those buildings. If you can find somebody else to tell you differently, you know, that's, <laughs> that's a risk you can take. Um, but the, these bricks are lower quality bricks than some of the bricks from the same time period. So now we get very, very regular uh, brick quality. You buy a brick, you know what you're gonna get. Back then, it was all over the map. And typically the bricks on the exterior, the ones that were going to be visible would be the best bricks of the batch, which means that the interior bricks and the bricks on the inner wives that you can't see are probably of poorer quality. Um, just again, this, the experience of exploring these, these buildings. And when we came there, we saw a lot of damage. And you see here at, at kind of critical corners uh, where you had bricks actually falling out and breaking. Um, that's the building as it is now. And what I'll, I'll get into, so for, again, for most buildings, if we can drip the water off the brick and make sure it doesn't stay resident on the brick, 
then it's got a very low likelihood of experiencing freezing, right? So if it's liquid water, that means it's above freezing. And if we can get it to not be on the brick when it, when it freezes, then we don't get the damage functions of freeze and thaw, which is the same reason that we get potholes in the roads, right? So same function happening on your bricks. Very often you can have buildings that are designed where the roof drains the water off and the water goes away and every uh, window uh, um, detail drops the water away. In this case, as you can see in this window detail here, it actually sucks the water in. By capillary action, the water is actually gonna move inward uh, um, with the surface tension moving it inward. So it is conceivable. I, I, so I would say if, the commitment was definitely, we want to maintain the bricks and we want to have it look exactly like it looked somewhat. It's conceivable with significant rebuilding and adding very important details, you might be able to get the water off the brick and keep it off the brick so that you don't get the damage functions. Can I interrupt real yes, quick? Yes, of course. Just real, real fast. So last week, we had a mason come and repoint most of that building or oh. uh, spent a couple of weeks, or a, couple, a couple of days or a day or two. Mm -hmm. uh, Chief might know a little bit better than me, but I know that he went through and remortared. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that fixes our situation because it was pretty, you know, it was a pretty fast job, but you're right. A lot of the window sills and all suck in the water. And just because we repoint a bit here and there, I don't know if that fixes the quality of the brick itself. But I just want to mention that step has been done last week just to give yeah. everybody a heads up. Okay. Yeah, so that that is the sort of thing that, well, you would want to do that anyway. Mm -hmm. Whatever path you went through, you'd want to do that if you were going to keep the building, right? Yeah. Um, it doesn't change the quality of the brick. It changes right. the quality of the mortar. In fact, depending on the mortar he repointed it with, he could actually have made the damage function worse. Mm -hmm. I don't know what mortar he used. Yeah. But what you typically want to do is actually the mortar should be sacrificial. You actually want this mortar to be weaker than the bricks so that it breaks first. Yeah. Um, and modern mortars are actually a lot stronger than these bricks. So it, we don't, you know, that's not something we know about. So my, my point is just that there, there are a lot of characteristics and details and kind of built-in things about this building where it's already being damaged. And I'll show you on the next slide uh, after I talk to Tim. <laughs> on the next slide, I'll talk about what happens if you were to insulate from the inside. Yes, Tim. So these are all several questions that relate to, um, first, it, I, my understanding is that a lot of these sills are not original sills and that when this was a repair at some point, that was the wrong repair. And so, one would assume that you would install sills that would do what they used to do, which is keep the water off the brick surface. Um, the, the mason who did the repairs is a restoration guy who's got 40, 45 years, 50 years of experience doing this work. So chances are he used a, a soft mortar. Yeah, that's um, and finally, the question is, when I look at the exterior of the building, I see most of this damage in the lower portion of the building. Yes. And so, um, and so I wonder if extensive lower portion restoration with a good quality brick in the areas where it needs to be repaired would serve a useful function. And finally, you look at superficial, you didn't actually go in and take a brick out and say the brick inside is of a lower quality. You're just assuming based on your experience with buildings or did you do that? No, I, so we were there for, you know, probably an hour. Um, I did pull one brick out because it was just completely loose and I could pull it out. And I looked in there, but so I guess I could, we could back up and look at a, a different process. If you were committed to really investing in repairing the whole system, adding curfs, drip edges, uh, additional horizontal details to, to move the, the water off, et cetera. You would want to core the brick and actually analyze all the wads. You'd actually want to, you know, drill, you know, gra grab a core. Um, and, and, and none of that is stuff we did. So this is all superficial. Um, 
but it's also, I mean, generally there's a heavier water load on the lower portion because you got a lot of splashback. That, that's that's natural. Um, but I did see a fair amount of of staining and water damage higher up, and I'm going to explain to you why why I'm worried about it now, uh, mm -hmm. if you were to do something to improve the building. Uh, so I see Julie and Carolyn also have hands up. Um, I, I guess I just want to say that I, I, I believe it was steam heat before on the inside and you didn't care about energy efficiency. So that's how the bricks got dried out. You know, I mean, how we would dry it out. So I totally understand how you would use interior insulation. And then because of that, you wouldn't have the possibility of drying the bricks. I was just wondering if is there's a way to seal the bricks once we, um, you know, so you don't have to worry about water damage. Um, to me, that would be maybe the way to go. I don't know. Short answer is no. There have been these products out there for years. Um, they all fail. Um, and when they fail, they tend to fail kind of dramatically. Um, and so, I, I, again, you might find somebody else who has, has a different opinion, but I wouldn't want to recommend that approach. Um, generally speaking, building science, anybody in the, in the field of building science will say that um, impermeable systems don't actually exist. And so what you want is uh, the belt and suspenders approach, something that lets water in and also lets it out and keeps it off to begin with. So, so I, I, um, this kind of shows you the, uh, um, the current conditions. So part of the reason that you don't see any more damage is because there's no insulation on the inside and the space is heated. In fact, the space might be a little overheated um, based on a, uh, we went a second time and, and we're just there. Um, and so what happens is that heat moves through the building. And so you can see that on a particularly cold day, it's 12, 12 degrees outside, on a particularly cold day, the outer wythe experiences freezing, but the inner wythes do not. And so that's one reason why it's protected. So you have the best brick on the outside and, um, and it, experiences freezing a whole lot less. And this is on a particularly cold day. So there are lots of hours of the year where it's considerably warmer while still being below freezing. And on those days, you could imagine drawing a line here and getting the bricks not freezing. But if you were to insulate from the inside, all of a sudden the entire wall is below freezing quite frequently. And so if moisture gets in there, it has a lot of opportunity to do damage. I'm sorry, Julie, you had your hand up and I ignored you after the first question. Myself unmuted. Um, yeah. I don't know that I wanna go into it, but so I went by and talked to the guy who was repointing the lower part of the building. Um, his recommendation was um, if we, if we were to refurbish the building that we seriously repoint the entire building. And then if we have the scaffolding up to do that, then we spray it with a breathable barrier um, that will allow the moisture to come out, but will reduce the amount of moisture that gets in. Um, he was of the opinion that it was actually in quite good shape. And if you look at the lines of the building, there's no like sagging or bulging or major cracks or anything. Um, right, the foundation is good. The bricks, the interior bricks are in good shape because they're being heated. Okay. Um, so the, uh, the spray applied uh, sealant that's that's uh, what uh, we were just talking about. I am definitely not claiming that I have explored every single one of these sealants. And um, you know, if, if the town wants to, you know, get some consulting from somebody who has more experience with these sealants and they feel confident about recommending them, um, 
you know, I'm not going to say that that's not a solution. I just know that the ones that I've looked at in the past uh, were not very durable and led to other problems. Um, but technology is always changing. Uh, you know, uh, chem uh, chemical engineering is is a is a wonder, and you know, people are doing things that I may not know about. Um, nonetheless the same dynamic still occurs with insulation from the interior. That doesn't mean that we can't do some things about it. So I would say if, you know, so our proposal, which it seems like everyone's aware of and, and also does not like, <laughs> was essentially let's protect the bricks by either insulating from the exterior, which protects the bricks completely, or by adding glazing to the exterior so you can see the bricks, it's everything, all the aesthetics are, are preserved, or at least that you, you're kind of putting everything in a jewel case. And this allows you to insulate from the interior if you want, and you get a, a thermal mass effect. But it's not like, I'm, uh, you know, you, you must do this only, only this solution. That's what we proposed. It is possible that you could do a set of things. So I would say that the, the, the thing that I, I would recommend least or last would be this spray applied uh, uh, membrane. Um, if say, again, this, this would change the aesthetics a little bit. So a traditional thing with, uh, um, masonry buildings is to introduce a sacrificial layer. Um, so the bottom, basically below that, the, all, the space below the first, the first story windows would be a parged coat of essentially like a stucco. And the expectation is the stucco will get wet. The stucco will absorb the freeze and thaw uh, dynamic and will eventually fall off but that's okay, every few years you reapply it. And that's, that's a very traditional way of protecting buildings is this sacrificial layer. Um, there are some details that you have to work out on the interior of the building to make sure that you actually have uh, moisture flow that's going to the sacrificial layer and not towards um, things like the floor joists uh, that could then rot um, and fall out. So, you know, there are details, but we could work, uh, talk about those details. Um, then you could insulate from the interior, although you might have to moderate the amount of insulation from the interior to make sure that you still had enough heat flow through the bricks so that you were not experiencing freeze thaw as often, you know, so it was only under those extreme conditions. Um, so that is, that is a traditional and viable and effective method that I would recommend for most buildings, right? At, again, like I said, 90 something percent of, of brick masonry buildings, that would be the path I would take. Um, and so you might want to find a consultant who maybe ex, who specializes in this uh, to explore that type of a path and see if they're braver than I am. <clears throat> um, so, uh, okay, so that's, that's where we got to. It may be, and you guys can, can tell me this, we, we looked at kind of the original, this conceptual design where you're adding a whole lot of space, mostly to provide an auditorium. Our observation was you had a space that you weren't going to destroy that was next door that could be an auditorium and maybe you could avoid spending all that money to build such a large additional building. Um, and so we proposed, obviously, something a little different, uh, where you're protecting the bricks. Um, I can explain why we actually think it's okay to leave these particular bricks on the front uh, exposed. Um, and uh, but I'll, I'll come back to that if, if you want. And then we felt there was a need for a circulation area that also provided an elevator and exterior staircases and all those sorts of things that are right now a bit decrepit or or non-existent. Um, and so we can talk about the precedence if that's of interest to you. Um, but it may be that we want to pause there and just uh, 
forget about the technology we're proposing and just say, no, let's let's talk about the brick as it is. Hi, Lily. Yes. So um, I actually really like the uh, jewel case personally. So it is not everybody. I just want that to be clear. Um, and I was really excited about the shared um, geothermal. Um, and so I wonder a couple of things. Mm -hmm. If um, what is the impact on the, the whole geo exchange field with a couple of conditions? One, if we don't jewel case the the building and something else is done differently, but is does it have to be resized and stuff. But two, um, we would like to add, say, more buildings to the whole geo exchange concept. And, um, and it seems like you were saying we can't do half measures, but can we do steps? Yes. Okay. So let me answer both. I have a both bunch of questions. questions. Sorry. Yeah. Let, let's start with the question of let's imagine we do not jewel case the building. We do not insulate from the exterior. We have therefore limited the amount of insulation we're able to provide. Mm -hmm. That means that, um, and I actually let me go forward to my little uh, image of the loads, which is way to the front. Sorry about that. Um, where are we? Yeah, so, or actually maybe this is simpler, hold on. Um, this, this is the loads. So this is like the total amount of energy that the two buildings would use if we jewel case them. And what you notice is there's essentially no heating demand from that office because it's using the solar gain from the, from the jewel case and the thermal mass of the bricks to essentially do all the heating, right? It's just storing the heating in the brick and then moving it through. What you actually have is a pretty large cooling demand. Mm -hmm. And we talk about how we can offset that cooling demand, uh, you know, using outdoor air essentially to mostly remove that, that cooling demand and also deposit that excess heat. Essentially the solar gain from those that jewel case that goes into the bricks, you stick it in the ground and you let the church use it. That's kind of the big concept. So if we didn't do that jewel case, the result would be that the heat heating demand profile of the office would be a bit more like the church, except that the heating demand would probably be, you know, a good, it's just gonna be a bigger building with a higher demand, but the, because uh, got more hours of use and all that stuff. So it, the heating demand would be up, you know, somewhere higher, right? We didn't do the math on this one, uh, on that scenario. Um, but it would be a higher heating demand and a lower cooling demand. What that means is that um, you would definitely, definitely have to resize the uh, geo exchange loop. So if you look at this image here, if we put all the strategies together that our group came up with, so that's including this dual case effect on the, on, on the uh, offices, heat rejection and heat extraction are roughly balanced, which means that you can have a very small geo exchange field because you're essentially balancing those two sy systems and you're just trading heat from one side to the other with a time delay that the earth allows you to have. That would not be the case if we don't have that essentially uh, large cooling demand and very, very uh, much higher heating demand. If we, you know, essentially if we switch over so that they both simultaneously want heat and simultaneously want cooling, we now need a bigger geo exchange field. So as we imagined it, or actually as we sized it, you could fit your geo exchange field just in the parking lot between the two buildings, which is very small. And generally speaking, geo exchange fields are expensive to build. But in this case, because you needed a place to have essentially a storage area for drainage, you could kind of have it do double duty and kind of double, double count the costs, if you will, or, or you know, double dip into the costs. And it's, so there's an economic efficiency to that. 
but and so just just to to finish Lily, uh, answering uh, Lily's question, um, there is no reason why you couldn't expand a geo exchange field. So you could put one there in the parking lot because that's a convenient place, and then you could put another one out in the field that's that, that's out to the back of it between the school and the um, and the church, basically you know that kind of area. But that one would be more expensive because you'd have to drill boreholes for that one. And you know it becomes a more expensive one. In all of these cases, the more buildings that share a geo exchange field, the easier it is to manage the heat flows because there's more diversity of those loads. So Tim. So just briefly um, explain what depth do these coils have to be at under the parking lot? And um, do they have to be below the, the frost line or how does it work? So uh, typically they're going to be around frost line. And the reason why that's okay is because you're actually depositing heat. So you're essentially erasing the frost line. In this case, um, part of the the design that as we thought about it is that you actually have a volume that you need to create for rainwater storage for you know for stormwater storage and so that volume actually gets you down to more like eight to ten feet and that allows you to do multiple layers of these uh uh, uh, uh link slinky coils uh so you would do you know one at say 10 or 12 feet and another one at say six feet and you might even have another one that's only used kind of at the beginning of each season <laughs> as because it, it's the most related to the current uh temperature and so you could kind of adjust which one is supplying temperature depending on the time of year and what heat's available um you know i i wouldn't take this to the bank and just start digging and, and, and install a geo exchange field, <laughs> you'd, you'd need to do a bit more work. Uh, Lily, yes. So I have two other questions to, to add to this. Um, we know that our water table is rising. Carolyn um, actually knows the number, but it, it is increasing and our winters are getting warmer and we want these buildings to last another hundred years. So yeah. if uh, if we're moving into South Carolina weather, which is supposedly where we're headed, um, does this same exchange system work? Um, because it's right now balanced right now balanced between winter and summer. And what is the effect of the rising water? Oh, so it's not if we don't do the Trom wall, the jewel case effect, right? Yeah. If we if we if if we find someone who's braver than I am to set you up with a system for this brick building that has some interior insulation, but probably a lot less than we recommended. So it has a much higher heating load. And it doesn't have this big solar collector on the outside collecting heat. Your actually your geo exchange field is considerably out of balance right now. So it would get more into balance. As the uh, as as the climate warms, um, but you know not for quite a while yet still, um, and so for that reason you'd actually need to have a larger geo exchange field. The farther out of balance it is, the bigger geo exchange you need, because otherwise you could freeze the geo exchange field and then it's a real problem for you, especially if it's under your parking lot. And what about the uh, rising water table? What kind of effect does that have on this? For geo exchange, that's actually beneficial because it makes your soil more conductive. Mm -hmm. um, and so that that actually makes gives you a better geo exchange field. Um, it may, so there's, there's another type of geo exchange field or geo exchange system, which actually uses water wells. Um, and uh, these could be standing column wells, or they can be uh, essentially, essentially like a water well you get for drinking water in your house, and you extract water one place, and you would inject it in another place. Those tend to have a lot of regulatory problem or challenges. Not impossible, but that's just something to consider. Um, 
but that might you know, given your circumstances, you get a geothermal engineer out there who's looking at the system, you know, with care and doing a good exploration of the soil, they might suggest that that's the better choice, um, or at least a good choice. Um, so partly because we know that the water table is rising, that is why we were so insistent that you needed the drainage systems that we suggested and a place to store the water and a backup way to move that water <laughs> with, a, with a pump. Uh, so uh, Trevor, then Carolyn. So just, I was just curious, you know, just based on your, your, your experience looking at this, the, the building itself right now doesn't lend itself very well to a geothermal system until you until you have this dual kind of system, right? Because the brick, especially because if you're going to insulate it, you got to insulate it either on the outside or the inside um, to make to make this, you know, especially if we're going for, you know, net zero or, you know, energy efficient buildings, um, trying to add all that insulation just really puts a number on that on that brick. It freezes it if we put it from the inside and you have a lot more bricks busting apart and damaging because they get wet and, and all of that. So I get that. So really the only way to make it viable is to really encase it and kind of do it an outside structure and then you do have the the issue of cost of glass replacement every 20 30 years you've got to reglaze everything um it you know the look of the glass cleanliness of that over the time um it's just a lot of work to try and save a building you know a lot of this is you know mm -hmm. we always wondered like is it worth saving we have different people with different opinions so I just I just was curious what your thoughts are unless you encase it it doesn't really make sense it I mean it may maybe make sense to save the building but maybe not do this geothermal so I want to back off of that a little bit okay so I, so in the same sense that I'm not confident enough to recommend in uh, doing some tricks and then insulating from the inside <laughs> I'm also not confident enough to say that it will definitely fail if you don't do what I say <laughs> um, because it's entirely possible that with a great deal of care and investment on water management details, like little details that are the that are what can make sure that the water drops off. So this could be something like modifying the roof a bit modifying uh, you know uh, a, a gutter system and um, modifying uh, the window details, all of the, you know, the, the everything having to do with the windows. So it changes the look, but maybe more acceptably. You do all of those things and you do a woofy simulation. So woofy is, is basically, it's the passive house system that uses multiple years of weather to simulate what would happen if you did these different things. So a bit more sophisticated than my little quick drawing of a line through a brick. Um, <laughs> you would do that simulation and you would figure out what is the safe level of insulation from the interior. And that safe level might not be zero, right? It might be something that's enough to allow you to do this system. And then you've made a compromise. You said, well, we're going to need a much, much larger geoexchange system but we can still use that system, right? We, we can still design it for this much larger load. Um, you have the property, you have the water resource. So it, it, I do not wanna create the impression that this one path is the only path. It was a path, it's a part of this, remember this is a class. And so we said, What's, what do we think is the best solution? What do we think is creative? You know, all those things are uh, go into coming up what's with what's the solution. And we didn't have the resources or time to go core the brick and uh, um, do the woofy simulations and all this other stuff. Um, so so that's that's how we ended up there. So I don't want to create the impression that there's only one path. Uh, Carolyn. Uh, I think I think um, I think we can do an open loop system like Springfield Tech did, um, 
technical college because um, everybody is on town water downtown. But I'm, I'm trying to get my hands or my head around the idea of, I mean, normally when you store water, you store water in, like in a gravel or an open chamber system. And so how, how, do, how does the water storage help in our, in, our, in our system here, having more water? Because Lily said, well, since I was on the planning board, the, the water table has gone from about 18 to 20 inches higher um, over the years. And, and we're gonna get more water that's just what we're gonna be hit with climate change and more extreme temperatures. So we're more concerned with cooling rather than heating in the long run. And, and so I'm just trying to figure out how, that, how the water works. And I was just hoping you could go over that a little okay. bit more so again. Two, two components. One is how the water works in a geo exchange field. And the answer is, if you have soil that's saturated, it's more conductive. And that means your geo exchange field is actually better at supplying heat or cool, whatever, you, whatever you're trying to do to your, your fluid that you're circulating. Um, or if you had an, an open loop system, which for a number of reasons I, I'm hesitant to recommend, they require heavy, they have heavy maintenance burdens as well as regulatory burdens. But if you went with that, potentially there's what's called advective heat transfer, which is to say, if you suck that water out, it sucks water in from everywhere else around it. And that moves heat into that space. So, um, so having more water actually makes the geo exchange systems work better, either one. It doesn't mean that it keeps your buildings from getting wet and rotting or, uh, or moldy or, or, um, or having freeze thaw problems or any of these other things that happen. When you have a high water table, you have to manage it. The systems that we suggested, and maybe we should go into a bit of the imagery having to do with those systems, if that's helpful. Um, let's see. Um, uh, so there's drainage there. Um, sorry, let me. So the basic I idea with these with these systems for the brick building, we actually want to take the water that falls onto the ground and bring it around and out before it ever gets to the brick building, right? Um, and in a sense, when you create a, you know, a drain, essentially like a French drain type system, what you do is you actually lower the water table to whatever level that drainage goes to, right? So essentially around the building, there's now the lowest pressure is to go into the drainage system. So the water near the building actually kind of moves, moves down if you, if you control it that way, if you create an, a negative pressure for water to come into. That only works if you have a place to put the water, which tends to be a deeper pit so that you can put it uh, down and a pump to move it to some sort of cistern so that after a storm event, you can move it away. You need to still do all of the damp proofing or waterproofing things that you need to do to move that to keep that moisture from entering the building as you've got a high water table. But at least if you give it a low pressure place to go to, that is what it's required. With the church, because of the kind of foundation it has, if you were to dig around the exterior, you would potentially disturb the foundation. And the interior is already, uh, essentially it has rivers running through it on occasion. So the system that we designed is basically to the interior. It basically lets water permeate through. And then you've got a drainage system on the interior that essentially lets it come through and then it goes out that way. So both of these are absolutely necessary and will only become more necessary as uh, a water table rises. Uh, Julie and then Tim. Or Carolyn, did I actually answer your question? This was, I'm trying to, water management is a huge issue for us. So yeah. I'm just trying to get that straight in my mind. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so Julie. Um, can you spell woofy? W, 
at W-U-F-I. Thank you. It's a, uh, it, the acronym is from German and I can't remember what it, <laughs> what okay. it stands for. Um, but that's probably Googleable. So, yeah, it is. <laughs> okay, um, so we have a really large, we have that ball field right behind it. So we have a really large area and the intention, I, I think the intention is that that will remain a ball field for a long, long time. Um, I'm seeing a head shake. Um, Actually, Julie, it's going to be, that's where our senior housing is going to go. We're moving the ball field over to Brayburn. Oh, okay. That's then I take it back. Never mind. That's one, that's one idea. That's one idea. <laughs> um, how close, you said the foundation of the church requires that you don't dig down next to the foundation. Like how close to the foundation can we get with, you know, as we're disturbing the ground for digging our cistern or putting in a new parking lot or whatever? Um, okay, short answer. I have not explored the foundation in enough detail. So I, I'm talking about what I saw plus my knowledge of rubble foundations generally. Yeah. Um, and I would say, the closer you are to the surface, the closer you can get to the foundation and the far, <laughs> the, makes sense. Yeah. You know, the farther down it goes, the farther away you should be. I would generally, especially if it was like heavy vibrational equipment or stuff like that, not knowing the soil well enough, like there's a lot of unknowns here, right? Mm -hmm. I would want to stay a good four feet away minimum. Oh, okay. Uh, but it's just something you know, that, that needs to be on our radar that we need to be aware of in the future. Thanks. Right. Tim? So a, a couple of things. It sounds like, if I'm hearing you correctly, there is, there's probably some graph that you could do that would say insulation and heat load and a maximal point where you would, uh, you would reach some sweet spot, which might not lead to a net zero individual building, but if you have enough buildings in a system, you might reach a net zero because of overcapacity with somewhere else. But whatever we decide, oh, that's a consideration we need to take into. Is there, a, is there a point where it makes sense to have less insulation and more, more heat use and uh, come up with a viable building? Here's and, why that's a lovely idea in principle, but doesn't actually turn up in, especially in retrofit situations, okay. which is you're not going to be limited by cost effectiveness. Well, I wasn't worried about the cost. I, I mean, cost effectiveness of like, we're going to have, you know, if we insulate more, we can have a smaller geo exchange field and the geo exchange field costs more up to a certain point. So there's going to be some, some marginal cost at which those two meet in the middle and you find the right thing. It's true. There, is, That point would, would arise and we could do it doing energy model of building and so forth. Okay. But what we really are concerned about is the durability of the building. Right. Right. And so you basically put in as much insulation as you can get away with without damaging the building. Right. And, that's, and, and that's what you're stuck with. Yeah, and then so that's, you, I guess what I was, I was getting at is that when we, if we go ahead with this project, one of the things we need to tell the engineer is this is what we need to be focusing on when we decide how much insulation to install, a balance between the, the heating, um, the, the insulation factor that we want and protecting the exterior brick. So, yeah, I mean, except that it's not a balance really. It's like it, there, there's a kind of a, you've crossed over a threshold and now the brick is too right. dangerous. So I would say that the approach would be you get a woofy analysis mm -hmm. and you get, whether it's me or somebody else, uh, providing you with really detailed architectural designs for water management. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. if you manage the water well enough and you don't insulate the brick too much, <laughs> um, you can bring the risk down to a level that, it, again, you, the risk is never zero. And so at some point you essentially have to make a judgment call about what level of risk are we willing to 
to take and the woofy analysis will help you understand what that risk would be. Okay. And the final thing is we've been focusing on geothermal to the exclusion of any other thing. Is mm. there some combination of geothermal and heat exterior heat pumps that is another thing that we would be logically to consider or is it or mixing them is that create problems? It doesn't create problems in that right, you know, good HVAC designer can design something that does does what you need. Um, and what we often see in larger systems is where you have a cooling load that is so large that you don't want to reject all that heat into the ground because you it's much larger than your heating load. Um, then you will actually say, in this case, let's reject the heat to the air using a cooling tower. This is not that kind of building. Like none of these buildings are that kind of building. Um, the challenge, like the, the reason to go with say an air source heat pump is essentially because it's cheaper. It's less efficient, but it's cheaper and you could do it. But once you've made the investment for a ground source heat pump, if you just make the investment for the one piece of equipment or you know the modular equipment, then it makes sense to invest in something that goes with that equipment. Um, so in the, you know, in this case, I mean, there's really no situation where we're adding an air heat, heat exchanger for heating is gonna make sense compared to just add, adding another borehole or more capacity in the ground. Um, but you could make an argument for not doing a ground exchange at all and going with air source only, and that's viable as well. Um, it doesn't have the nice network effect of sharing the loads and therefore dropping the total equipment size a little bit. Uh, we have a bunch of hands. I don't even know who was first. Maybe Denise. <laughs> okay. Um, so Ben, I'm, you know, I was on the tour with you, and I think when we were there, we did talk about how we were planning on adding on. You know, so I was thinking that, you know, we did discuss if we did, if we're adding on to the, um, let's see, that would be the West. Okay, the West is where we'd be adding on. So that's not an issue for the brick. The, the North, I think we could also put some type of cladding on. So I think what we're really focusing on are the East and the South. So how okay, so about- there's your cladding. Okay, yeah. So how then, about on the East? And you were talking about putting glass on either side. If we could just do the spray sealant on there and then on the south, I do like the glass, but have you seen, um, it's the old Channing Beat and now the tree house. Mm -hmm. It's a gorgeous atrium, which could be, I mean, you sort of have it, but I mean, uh, we're talking about a slightly different where you dig down a little bit mm -hmm. to the basement, to the bottom floor, do a patio there and just have sort of an atrium. And I think that would be, I, I mean, I really like that idea. I think that MA, we, we talked about that, Lily. I mean, I think there's some great designs. I mean, I think I like the design, but I'd like a little variation to that design. Oh, so basically what you're saying is where we have this atrium space here, mm -hmm. you basically maybe use some of that, maybe you don't, and then you move it around to the front. So you, you're basically adding space or shifting the massing of the spacing. Yes, that will work. Absolutely. No, I mean, that's just architectural design. And right. I'm not going to say, oh, yeah, this is the, the only and best architectural design. <laughs> but that would take care of most, most of the issues with the brick. And we'd really only have to deal with the, um, the front on the east that's side. That's correct. Yes. So, I mean, I say, you know, that's, it's, it's not as dire if, as we think. <laughs> and if you look at this system here, again, so let's say you do that, you, you put a good deal of investment into some horizontal water management details. You add a parge coat down at this lower level, a sacrificial mm -hmm. layer. Mm -hmm. And you notice that we didn't glaze this part because it actually has good water management. Right? It's got this little roof here that drops the water off. It's got this other thing and there was not real a damage on that side of that roof. Um, and, and maybe you, you leave that uninsulated or much less insulated, but by 
having modern high levels of insulation everywhere else, um, you know, you, you've, you've made a compromise. Now, we sized the, you know, we, we did all the heat, heat loss and gain calculations based on this design because it's what we did. What you described would be different by some amount, you know, whatever, probably a little bit less cooling demand and a little bit more heating demand, but less dramatically than an all or nothing thing. So yeah, that seems to me like something. And, you know, we had an architect, or not an architect, an architectural master's degree student who came up with the design, but she was under pressure and, you know, she's just one designer and you could probably find another architect to do closer to what you described. You. Uh, Kate, maybe? <laughs> Hi, um, thank you for all this. It's been so interesting. Um, my question is about not energy or um, HVAC, but uh, water and, you know, waste systems. And is that something that is going to get talked about um, with other people because I, I've been into buildings where there's like composting toilets and um, it just seems like a really smart way to, to do uh, water management or so I just wanted to kind of put that out there as a, as a thing that I've been interested in for many years and think it would be cool but I don't know if that would you know meld with what you guys have put forward here. So it would in theory right so we didn't address it um, you know, it's not a, a major energy user. It, it wasn't related to, to what we were asked to look at. Um, I guess to some degree, uh, you guys may be the ones who could make it happen. If you wanted a composting toilet, right now it's illegal, <laughs> but perhaps you guys are the ones who could make it be legal in your town. <laughs> um, but don't they have that in... Uh, um like at Hampshire. Yeah, Island, yeah, you, yes, yeah. you can get waivers and uh, you can demonstrate um, the alternatives and you could do that. It tends to be pretty expensive. And if you have a wastewater treatment facility. That we just spent 22 million bucks on. Yeah, that's, oh, yeah <laughs> that's a pretty good system too. Um, and so, uh, it's, so it, it's absolutely, uh, a worthwhile thing to think about, um, but has to be weighed against the costs of just using a facility that, that you have. Um, and there are a bunch of other things to do with water use reductions. Most of that has to do with irrigation rather than fixtures inside of a building, especially an office, which uses very, very little water. Uh, I guess Julie, then Trevor? My question is quick. Um, if you do the core of the brick, can you then, like, what do you do with that? Can you sample the brick and test? That's exactly it? what it is. You're taking, water. you're taking a sample all the way through the brick. It, it's it's destructive testing, right? Mm -hmm. You're actually making taking a sample, yep. and then you're breaking that sample up into pieces so that you can do things like, it, subject it to actual freezing and thawing, and see how it structures, what the structure of, of that material happens and how it falls apart. Um, you're doing things like putting it under just regular uh, load bearing tests to see, uh, you know, essentially how good is it? How tough is it? How resilient is it to the types of stresses that you wanna put it under? And that information can be put into your WUFI model so that you can basically, subject the model to the stresses and have the bricks that are actually there represented in the model. So if we're doing an addition on the back that has an elevator and we have to cut through the building anyway, there's a logical place to do this sample. Great idea. That, um, Great idea. Okay. Thanks. Trevor. I guess just my whole thing about this from day one is like, I know this is not a popular thing, but just the cost of trying to save that building versus building a new efficient building that has similar characteristics, but is much more energy efficient, doesn't have the immense maintenance of glass structures and all of that down the road. 
I just, you know, sometimes it is worth starting new. And I know that's not a popular thing, but dollar wise um, and longevity, I just think it's important to just have that also in our thoughts, not just how we can do a massive geothermal system and massive glass structure and to save this building, which I know a lot of people are attached to, but you know, just we got to also look at long term cost and is it worth doing that versus building something efficient and new that can be just as beautiful and will be beautiful in 100 years. So that's all. That's my two cents. So I, I think um, I think that is a really valid point of view. Um, and you did set it up as a cost comparison. And the only thing I'd add is for a true cost comparison, you have to have the scenario where you either actually take the building down so it's not something you're spending money on, or you have to include into that cost scenario that you still have this kind of difficult to manage building on the books that you have to manage and, right. and that will co cost you things. So as long as you're doing true apples to apples, I think that is an important thing to do. Thank you. One other aspect to that is the source of funding, because if you do a historical and you can use CPA funds, you can do that without raising the taxes. I hear you. I definitely hear you. Ben, I, I, I just want to let you know that it's 730. We appreciate all your time. And I just, you know, we didn't say how long. Um, <laughs> And that, that's certainly up to you. I mean, I don't know how many other questions there are. I don't know how long you can stay. And I'm okay for now. Um, I can't speak for Lauren, who <laughs> I haven't really let her even speak. <laughs> but um, I, I figure I'm here now and I want to be as helpful to you as I can be. So I, um, if you have other things that you want from me, I'm, I'm happy to be here for a little while. Okay, thank you. I would just say real quickly before everyone and, and Lily, just thank you. This is a lot of good information and, and, and I didn't get a chance to look at it all beforehand. So it's really great to have you here to speak to it. And um, it's fascinating. So thank you. I think no, Lily. I just wanted to, oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to reiterate that, yes, this was a class project. And I think, you know, we're just so grateful that you came out. And you know, I just look at this as being a springboard. It's not, it's not the final mm -hmm. anything, but I think it has elicited a lot of questions, a lot of really good questions. And I just want to know, you know, how, where do we go from here? How do we continue? And Ben, I know you you'd mentioned something about possibly working with us afterwards. I'm I'm just not sure how that what you meant by that. Uh, well, my what I see my role as is being the facilitator to help you get to whatever the next step is to, okay. so if you know if this prompts you to get an architect to come up with a design closer to the one that you described um and they have questions that they want answered i can help answer those questions so that they don't have to go hire another person to go redo our work or to um uh you know charge them money to to tell them something that that maybe i already know um you know if we didn't really talk about the church um but you know if that's actually a much simpler one and if that were something where you guys just wanted to essentially pursue that part of the plan and you wanted to hire contractors to do it i could help you come up with the rfq for that component you know uh lily i think well i want to say thank you too before i ask a question I, this has been great and i i love the glass and i just think you should tell your students that anyway um but one question i have is that um there's a maintenance dimension to all of this like if we expect this building to last or whatever building to last 100 years as we're talking about um this is is it in the woofy system that you can put in the different calculations about like the mains that Trevor's talking about the glass and and do you need experts in the systems to manage like are they expensive kind of a thing 
it is is that part of the woofy that you get to put in no. the, the maintenance? No, no, the, the woofy is everything has its own tool that you know is it, that you bring in these tools and you try to try to use the appropriate one. So the woofy is basically there to tell you or to, to give you a better sense, and it can be misused, right? You can you can put the wrong inputs in, you can get the wrong out outputs, get a better sense of the durability of the building to the types of environments that you're going to put it in, given a bunch of scenarios. It doesn't tell you about the regular maintenance components, such as glass needs to get cleaned every now and then. Um, certain types of claddings require painting, certain types of claddings don't. Um, what I would say is that the types of HVAC systems that we specified probably re require less maintenance than most of the ones that you're used to these days. So if you're used to a building that has like an oil fired boiler in it, that pretty much needs annual maintenance. And, uh, you know, there's, th there's usually some sort of something that has to, to, to go on with it. Um, if you have air, uh, air source heat pumps or any sort of, you know, air AC system, um, there's, because the uh, heat exchanger for the outside is exposed to the elements, it tends to last a lot shorter period of time and require replacement. Um, geothermal systems, by contrast, typically last 30 or 40 years with minimal, uh, you know, depending on, on the systems. The one we described actually does not require glycol and glycol is actually ends up being a fairly high maintenance material that needs to be replaced. But the truth is you can design these systems such that they don't really require it um, or that they only require it in a tiny portion of the system. Um, so I would, I would say the HVAC systems by being simpler require less maintenance. That's the other thing when you reduce the loads, right? When you we don't have to have a big heating system because you've got good insulation. It's really a very small, simple system that's providing the heating. It doesn't require any elaborate systems that can break. Um, yeah, so that's what we got from that. Uh, Julie, I guess, then Tim. I feel like I'm hogging the questions and I get a million questions. Um, thank you so much. This has been really, really interesting and the, the, the whole, both presentations, I, I really, learned a lot and found very interesting and really appreciate all the work you and your students put into it. It was great. Um, you mentioned the church. Mm -hmm. I looked at the thing. Um, you were talking about how it would be easy to insulate the church because it's got nice wide yeah. studs are. Did you look at just the sanctuary? Or did you look at the addition also? We did okay. not get into the addition. Okay. Um, so we made so we'd have to look oh, actually that. that's not true. My student went on his own. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so he did get into it, um, but I did not personally see it. Um, so it was more of a two by four structure, not, not the- So that would require more ways. work in order to insulate that. Uh, I think you would, pr depending on how you chose to use it, um, that would, de de would depend on, uh, that would be the, the challenge. Honestly, I would be inclined to not use it. If, if it was just me, it was my decision, I would be like, this particular thing is not worth saving and doesn't serve a very high function. Yeah, Trevor. Well, oh no, Tim, Tim was first, but okay, I, I just, I just a little bit, tidbit of information I wanna share. Um, <clears throat> yes, first thing, thanks. Um, I, I do think this was wonderful. Um, <laughs> I wondered if uh, you, did any um, cost estimation of the size of the, the, the system that you thought would be necessary for these two buildings, or if you have any any uh, thoughts on that? I guess it could be depending on what what the climate for this kind of material is, like a COVID or non-COVID. But um, uh, we didn't do cost estimating. Um, I, I think on the church we would be more that would be a more realistic thing to do again, because it's closer to just doing retrofit things that are typical. Mm -hmm. um, as you can see, just in the discussion, 
whatever we estimated for the uh, old school building would not have would not have any basis in reality. Um, and until we know what the loads are for real, we can't really size the geo exchange field, and we can't really size the equipment, and therefore we can't really price the equipment. <laughs> so we thought at this stage, it just it it was more about what are the high level concepts that yep. you wanted to go towards. So um, we are in the fall, we, we have some contractors coming into that church, right? We have no place, as you see the condition of our senior center, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we have no place for them. We're making a temporary space for them in that addition to the church. And I'm mm -hmm. really wanting to push supporting that floor structure in the sanctuary, pulling out the, well, the organs coming out this week. So pulling out the pews and really um, fixing the steeple and some truss work there and, and utilizing that space because I, I'm just walking around in there. It's really not enough room even temporarily for the seniors. So um, w the plan was to put some, some, I forget what they're called, mini splits and stuff in, in you know, just to try and get it for two or three years temporary, um, not spending a ton of money, but you know, 150,000 is, is still not small money. Um, mm -hmm. So just, you know, you had mentioned, well, I, I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't save that addition at all. It's like the most structurally sound part of the building mm -hmm. right now, yeah. but you're right. It's, it's, it's two by four on cinder block and, and, you know, kind of a crawl space underneath a bit. And, and the other space you're right has very thick walls, you know, so, insulation of that space would be definitely you know doable um once we get the floor structure strong and the steeple strong so i just was dropping those little bits for everybody that you know we we are about to spend a little bit of money on that place and i don't know just so here's here's the good news is that um you could invest in those mini splits um and if the church isn't ready to get the other work done on it and you're just putting something in as a temporary space. I mean, um, there's still a mustiness. I, I would probably say that as important as the structural repairs that you described, which are correct, would be the foundation uh, waterproofing and drainage. Um, and at least if you go with the system that we described, that also happens to insulate the foundation walls. Okay. Um, and, you know, this is, if you're assuming that you're keeping the church, you do that and at least you've stabilized that component. Because right now I think that you have a moisture problem that could lead to bad indoor air quality and I wouldn't want to subject the seniors to that. Great point. Um, the mini splits, you just put in some mini splits for use as a senior center where you don't have a huge population of people, it, it, you don't, you're not using it as an auditorium. Right. 200 people, 300 people in that space all at once. No. The mini splits can handle that type of population. And the good news is probably, let's say you redo it and you do it exactly to the spec that we, we created. You can actually take those mini split equipment out and put them in some other building of yours. Greenfield uh, Town Hall was an example that I happened to participate in where they decommissioned a building and we took out the existing VRF system and stuck it in their city hall. Great. And, okay. and that worked for them. It's, you know, that's their heating system now and cool. Thank you. It's good to know about the waterproofing and the drainage stuff. I didn't, wasn't super aware of that. So yeah, Denise. Yeah, no, just, just to let you know that I don't think we've really decided, I mean, it, I don't think we've really decided 100% on anything, but but with the church, I mean, there was, um, and I think I'd sent that to you, there was a cold in Sweden report and talking about potentially turning that into some housing, some senior housing. And I think at that point, I think Bruce Coldham mentioned that you could get, I thought it was, was it eight, eight to 12 units in there? So I'm not really sure. I think MA would know better than I. But I mean, that, that was a consideration too. Um, I think we were thinking of assisted living, having oh. our, we'd have senior housing on the campus 
you know, the entrance would be where our current town hall is and have it out towards Bloody Brook way. But um, the idea is once we had the grammar school fixed up, the old grammar school senior center fixed up, and in addition of a senior center, then we would turn that church that was temporarily our senior center into maybe assisted living. We hadn't gotten that far, truly, but you know, that was the kind of the idea. You could move from, you know, independent senior living to assisted senior living right across the campus. So it's it's a, you know, for a residential style building, it's a two-story building. Um, but then you really elevator dependent. Um, for assisted senior living, that seems like um, I know. not ideal. Um, I, and you know, uh, far be it from me to tell you what you need and where you need it. Um, our main inspiration for that was that some architect that you had consulted with designed an entire addition to provide an auditorium for you. So we figured maybe you need an auditorium. <laughs> um, but if you don't, then that's not a good function for the building. But also you shouldn't build one. <laughs> I don't know, have people run out of questions? So, man, I was just gonna comment briefly on the Coldham uh, report. And, and that really involved turning both the senior center and that into, uh, into, into senior housing with, an, with a walk space in between. So if you just did it, I think in the church, um, it would just, it, it just would be so little space. It, it really wouldn't be, it would be a huge amount of renovation to a space that already serves a particular function and if we can skip having an, a big meeting room on the library and we can have a have the church provide that meeting space for you know all, all of the functions when we don't have to use frontier or the elementary school um you know it seems to me that that's by far the most practical uh, bruce's bruce's idea was was um, you know, involved both the buildings and, and was, you know, did involve elevators and it, it was definitely more complicated than, than what, and, and he didn't, he wasn't looking at any kind of HVAC system or anything like that. He was just as, you know, playing with the space from one walkthrough. So. I think the, the one thing that I don't want lost in this and the reason I think we started with that with that space um, for an auditorium is that we, this space is the one thing we lack immensely in town. We don't have enough office space. I'm very worried that remodeling that town hall is still not enough space for functions of a town hall. I, um, we never have enough room. We never have enough meeting space. We have zero storage. We, we have like a tractor trailer thing out back with records in it. I mean, there is just a lot. I mean, I, I just worry like for all that we do, I don't want that lost on, you know, looking out again, a hundred years or 75 years, 50 years. I just think space, meeting space, it's always great to have an extra room you're not using. You can always find space for storage or something. I just don't want it. I don't want to get lost in like, well, we don't need any addition because I think, you know, just really have to think about what we would do in what space. And if we ever have a planner or as the town grows, you know, we are going to need office space for sure and can always use meeting room space with all the meetings we have, <laughs> you know. Anyways, that's all. Thanks. Yeah, I was just going to say, Trevor. You know, I think we sort of we sort of scratched the surface on things. We, you know, we have a lot of plans and we've prioritized plans, but you know, there's still there's still so much to do. And and I mean, you know, we we have the um, 
you know, we have the design for the town hall and then the it's combination senior community center. And that, you know, that can change. It doesn't necessarily have to be as big as it is. It can be smaller. The church could be repurposed with an auditory and, for, you know, for other functions we could potentially rent out. So, I mean, we, we, there's still a lot of thinking to do. A lot. <laughs> okay. But Trevor, you're right. Uh, in relation to the fact that we do need, we don't want to cut ourselves short on space. The town hall is unworkable for so many, the current town hall is unworkable for so many reasons. Space is one of them. Well, yeah. Don't get us started on that. <laughs> it's, it's horrible. Julie? I've been thinking about this a lot and I would love to have a discussion with this group about this topic, not tonight. Um, and fairly soon, because like I'm working on an RFQ right now to hire an OPM to rehabilitate this building. So we got to figure out what we're going to do okay. short, like pretty soon. <laughs> um, the OPM is going to, I mean, that's the first step. And then we're going to hire an architect and then we're going to do like, what do you call it? Figure out how the space is going to be laid out and have public discussions and all that business. But I think we need to have a discussion before any of that happens. Agreed. Well, we can, we can decide on that tonight. Um, M.A.? I, I would, I would um, to double back on what Julie just said, I think we need to take more than an hour meeting in the evening. I think probably this discussion is a, is a, you know, an afternoon or, you know, a Saturday or, or mm -hmm. something, but it's, 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 it's to really delve into all of it at a much deeper level than we can at a CCI meeting. Well, yeah, a little retreat. I think for, like for a meeting like that, I think you have, everyone needs to be prepared for that meeting with questions ahead of time and really put some thought into it so that mm -hmm. when we get there, we're not starting from square one. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so maybe maybe our next meeting we can plan for that. <laughs> um, Lily, I was just gonna say <clears throat> I don't think our guests need to um, <laughs> hear all that. Yeah, hear yeah. This conversation. <laughs> um, but I, <laughs> I am curious. Tim asked this question in the chat, but I think it got lost in the sauce. Lauren has not spoken, and what is Lauren's area of expertise? And is there something that Lauren wants to share with us? Yeah. Good question. Um, short answer, no. <laughs> There's nothing I want to share. <laughs> um, I, I do energy efficiency work, um, and I work with Ben on. Well, I I helped bring this project to Clean Energy Core. Um, so I'll I'll take credit for that part. But Ben is the one who knows building science and historic restoration. I know nothing about. Um, and I um. I worked with the students on the presentation, but I um, then when towns are implementing the projects or trying to pursue implementation of, of our recommendations, I work on um, helping with grant applications and getting support from utilities where appropriate and things like that. Um, this project is, you know, very different than what we typically do because it's not like, okay, let's, you know, start thinking about applying for a green communities grant it's it's there are a lot of big decisions to make as you've said so um thank so you I'm really just listening right now thank yeah. you thanks lauren so do you have recommendations on green communities grants I, 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 can, I can community? talk a little bit about that mm -hmm. okay at some point well if there aren't any other questions um i I guess Lauren and Ben, if you want to stay, fine. If you want to leave, and um, I'm just thinking how to proceed. I mean, we can, we know how to keep in touch with you, and uh, you know, maybe we can have another conversation. Yeah, I, I, I guess I, I want to thank you for inviting us and for kind of introducing this interesting project, which was at least pretty good for for students to to dig into, and and I enjoyed. Um, and I just want to say that the part of the discussion that you guys started that you don't need us for is absolutely the most important thing, figuring out what you actually need 
it, it drives everything else, right? That's much more important than you know what what we do with bricks. Um, and um, so uh, it, you know we're still available to help you answer some questions, think about scenarios as you know as as, as you come across issues. Um, yeah, but thank you very much for inviting us. So thank you that, so much. So Ben, if people have further questions, does it make sense just for, send them to me, I'll compile them and then send them to you? That sounds good, yeah. All right, and we'll just take it from there. Thank you, Ben. Thank, really you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you so thank much. You, for it. Thank you. Right. Hi, guys. You're really valuable, thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lauren. You're welcome, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Wow. So, Annalie, are you still muted? You can't talk, can you? Oh, no, I'm here. No, I'm oh, here. Oh, okay. I didn't think that you had any. <laughs> There's, um, we don't have any town, other town committee meetings on um, June 16th, do we? I think, I think Julie, we got we to gotta get together and have some discussion so Julie has a clean direction. Mm -hmm. I mean, clearly, we're all pretty much everybody is thinking along the same lines here, but we need to have it more defined and more definite for Julie. Okay, that's fine. That so is, yeah, I, I don't believe there's anything on the 16th when I look there's at my a, calendar. There's a uh, Franklin Regional uh, Emergency Response Needs Focus Group just at five o'clock, just to let you know that. But other than that. Well, how about we meet at six and, and we have a real discussion on what we're talking about for the buildings. I mean, but I think that I agree that it's got to be more than just two or three hours. Yeah, I'd rather a weekend. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm more, like take, um, and, and the idea, I hadn't thought of a weekend, Trevor, but if we did take a couple of hours um, one day and then another chunk of hours the next day, you have time in between to, synthesize and it's proven science that your brain puts things together for you while you sleep <laughs> hey i know that <laughs> yeah. do you sleep those? Do you sleep? Yeah, right. that's you. when i grind my teeth <laughs> yeah. and well, also, I, I guess i would advocate for that is what i'm saying i, I agree that then uh, more time and actually being being in the two physical spaces yes i mean i think visiting the church visiting the other building some yeah. of us have done that yeah um, but you don't really have a sense of how big are the rooms in the brick building or how big is the space in the uh the, yeah. this the church right so i think that could be a useful place to meet as well yep a little field trip yes a little field trip we can do that and what do you want to do that on the 16th and do it at six, it's still light enough out you know, six o'clock and just get the keys to the buildings and we'll take a walk through. Yes or no, Annalie? Oh, I think the walk through sounds good. I guess I, without wanting to, certainly not wanting to go back to square one, I know that we did have um, some strong uh, community support for saving the buildings. I have to say that I really feel that Trevor spoke very wisely when he was speaking about sort of the pros and cons of that. And also um, our speakers this evening spoke very vaguely, uh, but many times talked about quote, considerable investment. And um, in order to save these one or both of the buildings and um, you know, it's not easy to have, a, have two options or several options before you, we don't, we don't, we just have a lot of vagaries. And when I heard all of that about the considerable, the considerable expense, I wish I could put a number on that and have it in relation to another number. Well, I think we all would like that, but that's yeah. probably not gonna happen. <laughs> certainly not right now. You know, I think the whole point is that, you know, we're looking towards a net zero campus you know, we're going along with, you know, net zero by 20, 2050. And I think that is a really good direction for us to go. First of all, we should be doing that um, in our in our 
planning, and that could really give us give us an edge, give us a leg up if we continue to talk to uh, people at the state and federal level. We could become, um, you know, a pilot program, a pilot town doing these. Well, that that's the whole intention. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I mean, I I don't want to I don't want to say no to anything at this point. I see two more hands up, Julie and Tim. Julie. I'll let yeah, Julie go. So it, it's more in response to what Annalise said that um, Ben was fantastic. I really liked the presentation. He raised a bunch of great issues, but it's just one opinion. And we had GRLA look at the building. They didn't say anything about the brick. We had the brick dude, Corpida, who does bricks for a living, look at the building. He thinks the bricks are just fine. So I'm not convinced. I, it, it's definitely concerning. I mean, Ben is very firm and mm -hmm. in his opinion i think it needs looking at but i'm not convinced that the building is not salvageable and usable as is um okay so, but we're having we're beginning to have the meeting that we're trying really right. the point is right, to right, right. The yeah, good point really that yeah. it's <laughs> and it's yeah. so mine mine is a more general although i second some of the things that uh, julie just said um, the building's 134 years old, or 133 or 132. The bricks, to me, <laughs> look good. But boatload of money is a relative term. And we've had estimates at the beginning of the process that Julie was involved in that started around two and a half million dollars. And then we've moved up to five or six million dollars. So boatload is in that range. <laughs> but also boatload, when we talked about the building at the back of it, I think mm -hmm. there were talks about six or eight million dollars for a new building. So we have to be realistic about the cost of a new building and the cost of an old building and how much it costs. And one of the prime reasons to save these buildings is they're the only old buildings that exist in the downtown of South Deerfield. So we may have to moderate or say, in order to save the church, maybe we have to focus in on a, one particular use. And see if we can do it for a, a million and a half dollars, then we save this New England structure and we get a use out of it. But um, it's not going to be cheap. Um, I think the so, church can be done for a lot less. Exactly. <laughs> the church is a building that definitely could be saved and made to look like a New England church and serve a good purpose for a lot less money than, than the grammar school. So uh, just- and that, Trevor, and that I'm going to change direction. Yeah, and I just um, I don't want to belabor this at all at all. But I and I think I agree that the brick lasted 130 years. I don't think it had to do with that. It was the um, if we change the insulation and how we use that yeah. building, then the brick may fail. That kind of thing. But you're right. It's been there 130 years, and you know, and and probably Corpita was like, oh no, it's fine. I'll you know, point it and all that stuff. But once we change the structure and how we use it, heat it that thing, then it's a, a totally different animal. But yeah, we'll we'll move on. Thank you. On, but yeah, so, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna yep. stop this conversation and then we're going to what everyone needs to do is to write down their concerns, their comments, their ideas, <laughs> okay, and be prepared for when we get together. But in the meantime, do we all agree? Do we want to meet on June 16th at 6 p.m. and tour the two buildings? And then we can. I, I move that we meet at, on June 16th at 6 p.m. with the intention to tour both buildings. Second. I second that. <laughs> all in we, <laughs> oh, I just want to add an amendment. Then we go in face to face and have some start to yeah, discussion. Yeah, yeah, after that, then we'll set up a time. So, Julie, yeah, yeah. I mean, how fast is this? I mean, who are you hiring, and what what's the timeline? I don't have it in front of me, but um, we want the RFQ out on July June 29th. so it has to be advertised on the twenty second. I'm going off of memory, but these are in the ballpark. Um, with the goal of proposals due July 15th ish, and we review them for a week after that, and the select board picks the person July 27th, if that's a Wednesday, something like that. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So, an idea is if we do this, if we look at everything on the 16th that night, 
is it possible that we could get together? I know Fridays people don't want to do. Is it possible to get together Friday evening with pizza at town hall and just sit there for a couple hours? I know we can't have beer, which is a bummer, but yes. <laughs> sit, there for, sit there for a couple of hours and and do this. Talk about it. How does that sound? I think it's important to do. Yes, because yeah. I may not be able to make the 16th. Uh, but I'll but I'll definitely like to be there on. Okay, the well you've been through the buildings, Trevor. Yeah, so yeah exactly. You can, you can do that another time. You don't just. Yeah, I move that we continue the CCI meeting to actually address business building concepts to come to an agreement on <laughs> Friday, June seventeenth at six o'clock. Is that what we said? Six o'clock, good. Okay, and, and the planning board, I mean, I'm sorry, and the select board is supplying pizza because we don't have any, we don't have any money to our budget. We don't have a yeah. budget. <laughs> we'll yeah, figure that we'll out. Chip in. We can figure that chip out. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. I'm actually not going to be here, but um, I, okay, because I'm, I'm with, you know, just talking it through is important. I trust everybody on the committee. Well, Carolyn, in the meantime, you can write down any questions, concerns, and you can send them to me and I will speak for you yeah uh, no it's just um i think it's important that we just we have to have focus and um, and we have to have consensus so i i mean i feel really comfortable everybody is trying very hard to work together the only update that i wanted to say is that we had our mvp meeting and we um prioritized the microgrid feasibility study because you know we have pretty big intentions of this campus and I think it really needs a solar heat pump geothermal combo. So um, if there's, um, my understanding is that the report for the green energy, green communities grant is finishing up. And then that, that would allow us to be eligible for another mm -hmm. green communities grant, right, MA? And the, yeah. idea, and the idea was be to uh, combine, we think there's money coming through the MVP program in the fall. So we wanna make sure that we get our feasibility study done. Cause I think based on this information that we've been getting from Ben, the, the, the load calculations and the combo con calculations of the system is so critical. So we need a really good consultant. And, and I just, you know, we're building for the next hundred years and we want net, net zero building. That's our sell point to the governor, everybody. Um, but, and that's how we're gonna be a pilot, but really you gotta have those calculations correct. Yeah. And um, my understanding is it's good. We have multiple groups, but we have senior housing, we have the library, we have the town hall and we have the senior center that will have loads that will, you know, they're the, load use will cross at certain hours of the day. And, and that means we have to have a pretty big system. And I think a mixed use system, like a microgrid, solar heat pump, whatever, is probably the most reliable too, from what my research is, is coming, because then yeah. you're not relying on any one thing. Well, yeah, I, I, I was gonna say, there, there are a lot of energy. I was, I was yeah. doing some research and there's, um, Let's see. Uh, but, uh, Denise, you're cut, you're cutting out again, Denise. Okay, I'm sorry. Anyway, we I can talk about that later. And this, yeah, this should be for the next meeting, y'all. Y'all are going into the details for what we're going to talk about. We're talking yeah, about no, when we're going to talk. Okay, so. And where are we meeting on the seventeenth? At town, town hall. hall. Okay, town thank you. Town hall, and I'll put I'll put that in the agenda. Um. I just wanted to say one thing, and that is green communities. I read the fine print uh, a little bit better than I had before, and they do not do feasibility studies. Okay. Oh, okay. Then it will have to be through the MVP program. We're not, it's not official, but maybe we can get um, that through that neighborhood grant that was just given. We'll be able to maybe get some technical assistance through that too. Yes, that's exactly what we can get from them. As a matter of fact, that is about the only thing we can get from them for this grant. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I'm so I'm cutting off that conversation. Anybody, anybody who has anything to report, 
less than two minutes. That is that we don't know Lily. Senior housing. We are still very, very challenged with getting people to respond. And I have been talking to people on my street and they still thought, they're still thinking, we're not reaching them. They're still thinking that they did that survey already. And it's very frustrating that we had to do it online only because of that's the way the FERCOG could do it for a variety of reasons. But at any rate, um, I'm gonna go to the senior picnic. I'm gonna have a couple of laptops. Um, we have um, little things being sent, handed out with the um, geezer garbage bags at the transfer station. Um, <laughs> I am one, so I can say that. <laughs> um, but please, if you have other ideas uh, about how to reach people, I've posted in Deerfield now. Um, there is a link on the front page of the town website, but when you click it, it's got a really bad scan of the old thing that I sent like a month ago that talking about me going to the senior center. Anyway, so ideas, please. Also, I did want to say that we have been awarded the Complete Neighborhoods grant, which is um, working with Greenfield and other towns. Um, we applied for it specifically for engineering studies, for geothermal, for the campus. And when we spoke with them, they said they didn't necessarily have those consultants, but I was, went back to their website and they will hire third-party consultants. But um, the other possibility is for design around water management, which no doubt has to be done for that campus regardless. Um, and shared parking and landscaping, which would also tie into any geothermal. So anyway, we um, we got it. And Denise, <laughs> Denise is our representative, and I am going to support her 100% in working whoa, through whoa, this. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So Lily, <laughs> you said an hour a week, and you would be behind me doing anything else. Yeah. And I'm okay. behind you guys. Remember, I'm the alternate. But it's okay. not an. It's not an hour. It's only an hour a week for the first month, and then after that, it's once a month. Perfect. And and um and it really is. Their people do the work. They give us services. There's no cash involved, so there's no management. But I think that the timing is awesome because if at the end of the seventeenth, we have consensus about what we're aiming for, then we can much more clearly state our needs when Denise goes to bat for us with, with, our, with our neighboring towns, because it's a pot of $250,000 to be shared. Yep, it's, it's good. Anybody else have any reports? My report. Just a question, follow-up question for Lily. How many, how many survey results do you, how many people have actually responded? So we've had, uh, oh, um, I think a hundred and last I checked out, like 155 people responded out of over two, a little over 2,000. It's a little bit better than 7%, whatever. I think you should take your yeah. laptops to the dump. The Sit problem the table at the dump. The Seriously. problem is it, people are not getting, they think they've already, this right. is, Anyone that I've talked to thinks they've already signed it up and, and we got to get them out of there and we got to get at least 25% so we can get better financing. Well, we don't know that that's the case, Carolyn. We're waiting to hear back from Melissa LaRose about the actual number, but we do want a much higher percent. How many of us have done it? M.A. That was my question. That's my hand was. I went on the town website and I couldn't figure it out. That's how dumb I am. So it's not on the town website. Where do I go to find it? All right, we'll take, let's take that offline. I promise you. Okay, I will, I will. send me something, Lily, and okay. I will get both Alan and I and a bunch of the residents here to do it. Oh my God, that would be great. Yeah, we're all awesome. seniors. That's by definition. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? I've got a few things to go. I'll just, I'll go. So we just, I worked with um, Casey and with our grant writer, our grant writer, Alice, and she did submit the community one-stop grant last week. And then Casey sent 
a note to Joe and Natalie because they said, let us know when you're submitting grants and we will support it. So they got back to us and said, yes, they will. So we will keep reminding them. Um, the chief and I, we were, we knew that um, Andrea had alerted us to the fact that um, McGovern was going to be at the um, Asparagus Festival. We also found out that he was going to be at Sunderland. And I'm sorry, I think the chief went to town hall because I think that was wrong. But anyway, he was at Bub's Barbecue. So we just stood and we, we nailed him as soon as he walked in because it was crazy there. And we just handed, we handed his, um, his person, Kobe, some uh, information, I think the postcard, and then also the letter that Tim had written that was really well written. So we didn't have a chance to talk. I mean, McGovern stood there and he talked and there was this really crazy woman who was, had a book up, Tre Trevor can tell you, it was really insane. We were there for probably a few minutes and then left. So at least we did that. Um, let's see, we still have not heard back from Karen Polito. We sent that letter that Tim wrote that all of us signed. Um, so we have to do a follow-up on that. So maybe when Casey gets back next week, I will check on that, but that's the important thing. It's great to do things, but we need to follow up on everything that we do. And then one last thing, we did get the $113,000 for the shared streets and spaces, and that's for the crosswalks across from the park, the crosswalks and beacons. And that was working with, once again, Casey and the FERCOG. So that was a really, really, that was, it was wonderful. So congratulations, uh, well, folks. Yeah, so I mean, we've got a lot of positive things happening. So and Tim can... and Tim has met with um, is working on Leary lot. So Tim, you should yeah. update on that a little bit. Um, yeah, Tim. Briefly, I've just um, begun discussions with uh, the engineer for Hamshaw Lumber about getting the actual plots surveyed so that the land swap can be discussed with meaningful meets and bounds. And um, I need to follow up with that. Uh, he was supposed to get back to me earlier in the week, but it's dependent on him contacting a surveyor that he wants to use. So um, hopefully by the end of the week, I'll have some more information about that that I can share. Okay. And then? Uh, quickly from the Energy Committee, uh, we heard via Casey that the landfill project, solar project has been delayed again because Eversource still has not done their part. Uh, they're now talking about, you know, like December, maybe they can think about starting to develop it. Um, it's, it's crazy. I emailed them today and said, is there anything we can do to speed things up? Because um, they haven't, they, I think they've probably prepared most of their stuff for coming to town uh, committees, but there's no point in them doing it until they get the information from Eversource. So it's all just on hold and Eversource is, in my opinion, just slow walking it, but who knows? Maybe they have a real issue, I don't know. But they said they got a really good report out of uh, the study that Eversource did about needs. And so they, they're anticipating it not being a very expensive for them to develop, but we know nothing. So that's really depressing, <laughs> but uh, I don't, I'm not, I don't know. And um, we also talked to Co-op Power about uh, learn, starting to learn some things about uh, canopy, parking lot canopies, solar canopies. And I won't go into any of that. It was, it was just a good discussion and we started doing some learning, but at like everything else, oh, they're much more expensive than putting it on the roof. So another expense if we want to do solar parking lots. That's it. Oh, I was gonna say, I'm sorry. One thing I forgot, I just wanted, I wanted to thank Julie for being so receptive and doing the community one stop. We'd field some questions to Julie and the chief and you guys are so good at getting, getting right back and getting the information and also the select board for writing the letter of support. So, you know, it's really nice that everyone's really working together and I think it's been really effective. So thanks, that was great. All right, anybody else? I see, I, you know, I see we have a Deerfield guest um, does our guest want to comment? I think that's John Pachorik. Oh, is it John? <laughs> I know he said he was going to be at a game and on his phone, but. I'm here, yep. It is John. Yeah. John, do you have anything to say? 
Go oh, ahead. God, no. No, enough has been said for the night. No. <laughs> are, are we I'll boring you, John? <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, John, for not saying anything. <laughs> okay. So if we don't have anything else, uh, Denise, oh, right? But we need to approve adjourn. the minutes from. No, no, we need to approve oh. the minutes from May eleventh. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. So moved. Second, yes. Carolyn. Okay. All those in favor. Aye. 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 aye, aye. aye. Okay. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> I second it. Thank you. Motion to adjourn the select board meeting. Uh, second. Second. All those in favor. <laughs> I drove I, 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 everything. I vote on all of it. Thank you all very much. Okay. I'll send out Goodbye. reminders. About, about June sixteenth, I'll send out reminders about the. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. A pleasure working with you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 bye.